Hi, and welcome to Vicente Sutterberg's Municipal Cannabis Law uh, Workshop. And we're really, really proud to um, bring you this program right now. We have two representatives from Massachusetts that I'm going to introduce you to, and plus a representative from New Jersey. My name is Heather Coomer. I'm a counsel at Vicente Sutterberg. We're the top ranked national cannabis law firm in the United States. We have offices all over the place. I'm located in New Jersey uh, with 10 years of both public and private experience, just some of my background. I uh, worked with uh, the Jersey City Redevelopment Agency for almost six years before going to the private practice. And now I'm at Vicente Sederberg and I'm very excited for this, um, focusing on land use and municipal law, as well as environmental and cannabis law. Uh, so in that note, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. And we're aiming for a round table type of discussion, just in general. Uh, there's so many things that you, we can learn from Massachusetts of all the, all of the benefits and as well as things we experience, uh, problems that we have not even anticipated yet. And how did they address it? So we're gonna go over all this stuff now and we're leaving it just a very sort of round table discussion here. Um, I'm first going to introduce Jennifer Flanagan, former Massachusetts cannabis regulator, uh, who's now the director of the regulatory policy in, at Vicente Sederberg. She's also a former state's senator. Uh, we also have Phil Silverman, counsel, representing also Massachusetts here, worked in the private sector. You can correct me later if I'm wrong with this. <laughs> um, and Chuck Latini, land use, New Jersey land use extraordinaire and cannabis, I want to say cannabis land use expert who represents <laughs> municipalities as well as um, private sector as well. So do you guys want to say hi a little bit for yourself if I missed anything right there? I'll say hello. Uh, <laughs> Phil Silverman, uh, uh, as Heather said, from Vicente Cedarburg. I've been uh, actually had had not even been in this field uh, prior to about six, seven years ago when legalization came. And all I've been doing for the last six years is um, a lot of local permitting and representing companies uh, trying to engage cities and towns in Massachusetts, trying to work with them to sort of implement legalization in a way that works for the cities and towns. So there's a lot of issues here. Uh, we're going to try and, and hit some of them, but it's it's interesting. It's, it's a controversial subject tends to bring out a lot of passion in people on both sides of the issues. Uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully we can sort of hit some of the issues that you're going to be seeing as you go forward uh, on the path to legalization. Jen? Sure. Um, my name is Jen Flanagan. Um, as Heather said, I'm the Director of Regulatory Policy here at Vicente Cedarburg. Um, I've spent the last 25 years in public service. I was a staffer at the state house until I was elected to the house and then moved on to be elected to the Senate. Uh, and then most recently was appointed by Governor Baker to be one of the five inaugural commissioners on the Cannabis Control Commission. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to give you some insight today as to what we learned when the commission was uh, established and sort of the, the path that we took here in Massachusetts. Um, and some of the things that you might wanna think about, not only from the municipality standpoint, from a state standpoint, uh, just taking a look at what legalization means, what it means for your communities, you know, what do you want Main Street to look like in your community, things of that nature, and a lot of things that people didn't didn't think about at the time. So hopefully we'll be able to give you some insight with your questions. And so last but not least, I would, I'll say I am Chuck Latini. I am a, a land use planner, a president of the American Planning Association, New Jersey chapter as well. Um, I've been working as a, a planner in our great state for uh, the better part of 25 years now, um, with the last uh, almost five now um, in cannabis, as, as Phil said, you know, as soon as you get into it, it feels like that's all you end up doing, um, especially, especially with all these moving pieces flowing all around, um, towns trying to figure out what to do, clients trying to figure out what towns are doing so that they can come in and do it. Um, but it's been a real interesting process uh, from the original expansion. You know, we, we learned a lot about how the, how the process in New Jersey amidst home rule and the municipal land use law and, and how that plays out. Um, 
and and just sort of the the bigger economic development opportunities I think that are out there for municipalities who who think about this more strategically. And uh, so I'm happy to be here and, uh, and and join the cause here. Great. So on that note, Chuck, do you want to just like give the overview just kind of a of what's going on in New Jersey now, right now with the cannabis landscape as far as what, you know, the deadline for municipalities, August 21st, like what's, talk a little yeah. bit about that. So, I mean, <laughs> where to start? Um, uh, let's let's start in hell. Right? <laughs> I feel like you know uh, the legislature handed municipalities a lot of control, um, while also handing us all, including the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, a pretty large task. Um, for municipalities, it's either opt in or opt out by that 180 days, which is panning out to uh, August 21st. Um, all while the CRC has been tasked with the same time frame in which to um, provide rules on the program uh, that they're going to utilize before accepting applications. Um, municipalities in a home rule state such as New Jersey play a huge role in this process. Um, similar to Massachusetts, while, uh, you know, which I'm sure Jen will speak on in a bit. Um, but from the basics of the application um, to what municipalities are empowered to do, the legislation really provides a broad framework, um, but my opinion yet specific enough to allow us all to move forward and, and at least allow our crystal ball to work a little bit. Um, uh, yet towns continue to ask for guidance as, as they should, because we, we, you never know what's behind the curtain. Um, and that's why I think many, many towns uh, you're, you're seeing in the news headlines are, are opting out at this point, at least for now. Uh, but towns are posed really with two basic questions in my mind that I see as tremendous economic development opportunities. Um, the where and the, and the how. The where being, you know, local zoning permit, of course, and, and uh, you know, where in your community you're gonna allow them, and, and the how, potentially leading to, you know, the official government uh, uh, body support that they need for the application. So on the, on the where side, you know, local zoning and land use, we, we have six licensed categories to plan and zone for. I would say eight if you're really considering how to truly facilitate both social justice objectives and true New Jersey-based operators in this micro-license category. I think even though they kind of fit within those same categories, there's special considerations I think we can all lend to the cause to help, <coughs> um, ensure success in those categories. And then, of course, you know, we all have to decide on whether or not we're going to allow dispensaries to do consumption lounges. So, the, the, you know, the basics behind the, the, the license, as many of you know, are cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, warehousing, retail, and delivery. Um, the three big categories of, of cultivation, manufacturing, and retail can be facilitators of economic growth, even outside of the cannabis industry. Um, as we see out west and, and even up north, you know, the, the spinoff of customers coming into an area are, are help supporting local businesses as well. Um, obviously, this industry is going, uh, you know, bring new job opportunities, but it also brings e energy and ingenuity. So plan for them wisely. Um, I say create reasonable conditions, you know, from, from a land use perspective. It's an opportunity to really take properties that may be grandfathered and stagnant in these business and retail categories and, 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 and make them upgrade to meet current zoning standards um, and, and facilitate revitalization efforts. Um, many of these comp companies in the industry are truly seeking to put their best foot forward. Um, so be creative, um, uh, but be collaborative, I would say, as well. On the house side, we, we see you know a lot of towns struggling with this whole local licensing category as well. You know, this is where I think the rubber meets the road. Um, you know, you you have an opportunity to really create a great partnership with some companies if 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 you focus beyond just the zoning and the cash grab that we see some municipalities um, going after. So. You know, after all, even, even even though the state is taking the lion's share of the revenue, we're all bearing the impacts, which, you know, are not nearly what some folks are imagining. This is not the boogeyman, but, you know, just like uh, 
any industry, there's some bad actors out there, but a thorough and transparent process that you create can really take that meet and greet and, and amp it in a way that forges some real relationships um, for folks that are ultimately going to be located in your community. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how all this is going to play out, Hev, um, but, yeah. uh, but I will also add that the state really needs to move these 2019 RFAs forward and out Definitely. the door. It, it's, to me, it's somewhat irresponsible, you know, to not only have companies spend considerable cash holding property, but the towns themselves are wondering whether or not they're going to play host to a, to a licensee as they're trying to prospectively plan for the potential of addition ones coming on, on a you know, on the on the books, so it's a it's an untenable situation where everybody's really afraid to call call a question uh, for a number of reasons, and it's you know it's not really that great. Um, but um, everyone outside the unenviable task of CRC and municipalities uh, that we're tasked with with are are sitting in limbo, and you know I think we, you know there needs to be some more accountability towards the administration's handling of this and. and really try to push this thing forward and and uh, <clears throat> move the politics along so Definitely. those of us with uh, risk tolerance and resources to move forward I think we should we should do so and uh, and, and and those whom uh, um, have to be more mindful um, you know pray <laughs> so you know that's that's New Jersey uh, at least my two cents of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's a great overview of everything that's going on especially if there's particularly some issues that you brought up that now I look forward to hearing what especially local licensing when you talk to Jen and Phil their experiences in Massachusetts and how we can relate this back to what we can prevent or encourage in New Jersey so on that note um, Jen for your perspective like what is your I mean I always think the interesting story and you have to tell about your vote. I always find that super interesting. Mm -hmm. So you have to tell about that whole voting thing. So, so, if, so the elephant in the room, yeah. I voted no in the question <laughs> when it was on the ballot in Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, I always find very, as a performer person that works at a municipality, I think it's a different perspective. We, we think of things sometimes. Right. And that shows there when you, or you didn't like the question there. So can you just give it like an overview of like what has happened in Massachusetts? What was your role as a regulator um, and your perspective, just of local control from as a regular, uh, as a regulator? Sure. So, you know, Massachusetts <coughs> does things in, in true Massachusetts form. Um, you know, just to give you a brief history, the ballot question passed in November 16. The law actually was signed in July of 17. The Cannabis Control Commission, we were appointed September 1st of 17. The regulations had to be completed by Christmas of 17, so they could have been promulgated by early 2018. Um, and the first store opened up in, I believe, November of 2018. Uh, given that fast track, um, I will also tell you that we had no staff. There was no one you know, answering our phones, writing our regulations, sitting in on meetings with us. We had five commissioners <clears throat> in five cubicles writing regulations. We also had to operate under the open meeting law. So there was no opportunity for true co collaboration because no more than two of us could have a conversation about any one given issue. Uh, so what we did was our chairman under his authority um, literally picked apart the topic areas that were going into our regulations, each one of us was assigned particular topic areas. And then we went forward, wrote our regulations and had to deliberate in public. So all of our deliberations were done at public meetings, um, really in, in the middle of December, which I'm really not sure many people were paying attention to us at, at that point. Um, so from my perspective, and we often joke that I went on the Commissioner K. Gura Roadshow across the state, talking to various planning boards, boards of health, elected official, I mean, municipal officials and the like, there was a lot of confusion. No one really understood from a city perspective or a town perspective what they were supposed to do. And under the Massachusetts law, you couldn't ban cannabis through zoning, which meant that you had to change your zoning to accommodate cannabis, however you were going to have that in your community. The difference in Massachusetts is that the only licenses that are truly limited our dispensaries. You're allowed 20% of your liquor licenses to become the number of dispensaries that you'll have in city or town. We don't have a number of, we don't have a limit on our cultivation. We don't have a limit on the product manufacturing. 
Um, we also created license types from micro businesses to 100,000 square foot, what we are called tier 11 cultivation centers. Uh, there was some there was some trouble that we ran into with regards to outdoor grows, given the fact that none of our deadlines coincided with a growing season here in Massachusetts. You know, if you're an outdoor cultivator, you legitimately get one grow season um, with the kind of atmosphere and, and climate that we have here. So that was sort of difficult for us to to handle in the, in the early days. On top of that, you know, communities were trying to get their houses in order. So in Massachusetts, the process is you go to the municipality, you get your community host agreement, then you're allowed to submit your four packets to the Cannabis Control Commission for licensing. So the state gives you the license, but there is an agreement at that local level, which I'm sure Phil has lots of ideas about and opinions about. Um, and to, to be honest and to be fair to him, the commission was hands off. We didn't we didn't tell communities if the, the HCAs were appropriate or not. Those, from our perspective, we didn't have that authority. It was an agreement between two parties uh, and their attorneys. And so why would we come in and say um, whether that they were they were right or wrong according to the law? So from there, you know, we really, we got our regs in order. We, we established ourselves. We started to license under the law. The current RMDs, the registered medical dispensaries, were supposed to be licensed first. But we, as a commission, came up with a policy that we were going to do sort of a one-to-one -one with social equity applicants. If you were an equity applicant ready to go, we were going to do an RMD applicant, but then we were also going to take you sort of out of turn. The one thing I will say is that Massachusetts does not take applicants out of the queue. You are in the queue when you apply. There is no putting someone to the front <coughs> unless you are an empowerment applicant and an equity applicant. Um, but for the for everybody else, you really stay in the queue for as long as it takes. So there were bumps in the early days because, you know, keep in mind, I said we had no staff. So we were writing regs and hiring staff at the same time. Uh, we don't have the 80 plus person staff that's sitting at the commission today who have done an amazing job during COVID and in, in continuing to license. But um, it was it was pretty bumpy, and I think it's because we just we did it in such a haste, and the timeline required it. It's interesting, and we're going to speak about this um, later um, after we heard later in this this call about the local licensing. So, just for everybody out there, when Jen was talking about the host agreements, so what makes comparing uh, comparing Massachusetts with New Jersey, New Jersey, we're now allowed to do local licensing. They've not given us any sort of directions of how to go about local licensing. New York, for example, doesn't allow local licensing. Uh, Massachusetts, they mandated a host agreement, which was their local licensing. And so well, when you hear- It's technically not licensing. I mean, you have to no obtain the host go. agreement, but your license comes from the Cannabis Commission. So that host agreement is, is just one of the requirements. You also had to have a community meeting. Um, in the area in which the actual facility was going to be located. The abutters had to be notified and the like. And I think we even tried to accommodate COVID by allowing them online, not in person. Um, but, but the one thing that I will say, you know, and I warn the municipal officials with, is that this issue of legalizing cannabis is such an emotional issue for people. You are going to hear the extremes on both sides one that wants you to legalize with no rules, the other wanting complete prohibition and can't understand why it's in their communities. You've got to be able to balance those with what the the statute says. And for us, we had, on top of that, we had to really fulfill the will of the voters, right? So it wasn't just the, the law that was passed. It was actually the ballot question. And so, you know, community host agreements, positive impact plans, how to be a good neighbor, be part of the fabric of your community, those all became sort of buzzwords in Massachusetts because, you know, as a former legislator, um, I care about what happens in downtown any city. Like I care about what happens to people in communities and the public health and the public safety to the detriment that people say I'm anti-business. Well, I'm not anti-business. I just want you to be a good neighbor. I want you to be part of the chamber. I want you to be part of the, the community that you're in, not just coming in here to say, okay, we're here, you know, let us operate. And so a lot of those buzzwords get thrown around, but the general public, honestly, sometimes doesn't understand the job you have to put in place a regulatory process at both the municipal and the state level. 
And that's just going to take a lot of strong people to be able to kind of wade through those commentary, commentary to, to get to the heart of what you want cannabis legalization to look like in New Jersey. I think that's such a great point. And I, New Jersey is just, I always say this, like New Jersey is very much similar, like Massachusetts, the way our uh, mentality is um, usually, especially the reaction for cannabis. I hope that we have such a market like Massachusetts in the future and more of a social equity system, but all the stuff you're saying about community benefits, those type of items and what it looks for you and giving back and knowing these sort of companies that you're going to be working with. Those are all things that I've heard municipalities, municipal officials talk about. That's what they want. Um, you know, and treat it like any sort of site plan application of like a redevelopment, any sort of redevelopment use, I always like to say, which in a big use, you're going to have some sort of community benefits and other sort of agreements. So with that note, getting into this sort of site location, um, someone dealing with more like the private sector, I'm going to talk to Phil right now of like, Having dealt with these site, I'm guessing site plan approvals ordinances, because you were more representing the private sector in Massachusetts. Sure. From that end, it's like, what did you experience going through this process? Like, through the whole sort of site, uh, you know, site site approval process that you guys, if you experienced in Massachusetts, what sort of items did you go through with this? All right. So, I, I, what I can say is, uh, you know, legalization uh, in Massachusetts really sort of took two stages because um, medical marijuana was approved first here. And then a couple of years later, um, we, we had adult use. So, uh, you know, the, the first thing that had to happen, and I think you're all going to be dealing with this in New Jersey, is every community has to figure out where do we want to put these. Um, and, you uh, you know, at our firm, we were somewhat fortunate because uh, our, our firm started out in Denver, Colorado. So we had something uh, to look to, uh, at, at least to some degree. Now, uh, the East Coast sensibilities are a little bit different than out in Colorado, as you might guess. Um, and and so it, it's not entirely uh, the same ballgame. There, there's a little bit more, I think, of a not in my backyard feeling uh, around here. Uh, so, you know, Every community was trying to look at this, and uh, you know we thought we saw uh, a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, some uh, communities created sort of what they would call a marijuana overlay district, and they'd kind of they'd get a map and they'd kind of create a boundary and said, you know, it can be in there. Um, others just said, well, it can be in anything that's zoned for commercial use. Uh, that was another way to do it. They all, you know, put in. Uh, various types of buffers, uh, you know, schools in particular, um, you know, everybody wanted, uh, you know, state law actually had a, a presumption of a 500 foot buffer uh, from schools and daycares and, and some other types of uh, uses. And, and so, you know, th those were the types of tools that people used to figure out where they would want to put it. Um, the, the initial way that, that a lot of the communities did it is they just decided, you know what, we're just going to zone it all for industrial, our industrial areas. And so they would restrict everybody, especially when the medical uh, had just first been legalized, they would, they would, everybody would zone it for their industrial area. Um, and, and, you know, I get it. Uh, you know, it, it was sort of the easiest way to go at that point. You, you tend not to have uh, many residences there. Uh, which means you have less people complaining uh, if you do that. Um, and, uh, you know, so so it, it makes a degree of sense that it's out of the way. On the other hand, it's out of the way. Uh, and, and from the perspective of businesses, consumers, it's not exactly ideal. Um, but everybody kind of felt, well, there's going to be so many security issues surrounding this, we've got to put it there. Well, turns out that there really aren't so many security issues. If you look at the way these places are operated, they're not uh, attractive uh, places for people who have an ill intent, I, I guess I would put it. There's just so much security there. And so as as we went from medical to uh, adult use, uh, we actually sort of started to broaden uh, where they were, people were willing to put these and where communities were willing to put these businesses. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was just a matter of the, you know, the, the reality was when you were just restricting it to a couple small areas, it was really difficult to find places where you could put these businesses. You have to realize um, that it's not easy, first of all, to find a landlord who's willing to rent to one of these businesses. A lot of them are reluctant because we're still 
you know, it, it's still federally illegal. Um, and so you have a lot of landlords that won't do it for that reason. You also have a lot of landlords who have mortgages on their property and those mortgages tend to uh, prohibit uh, leasing to somebody that's in a federally illegal business. So you were really limited um, as to where you could put these things. And then we started to see, you know, buffers that were created. They, the, everybody's zoning, as I said, you know, would, would say, all right, you can't be within 500 feet of a school. But then they would also add, you can't be within 500 feet of a daycare. And you can't be within 500 feet of a public park. And you can't be within 500 feet of a library. Um, and so that really starts to narrow down. Some other communities, uh, following uh, some, some indications in the state law, said you also can't be within 500 feet of, quote unquote, places where children commonly congregate. Now, if you know what that means, you're one up on me. Uh, but it, it became a problem. It, you know, every, uh, we had clients who would, would you know, sign a letter of intent to, to lease a particular place, and they would find out that there was an ice cream shop right down the street. And so, you know, they would look at the zoning and it would say, well, you can't cite these where, where children commonly congregate. That must be a place where children commonly con congregate. Interestingly enough, there was later guidance that was put out that said an ice cream shop was not a place where children commonly congregate. Because even though children did tend to go to places like that, there weren't regularly scheduled events there. Um, and so I think there was some sort of recognition that it's going to be real hard to, to cite these businesses anywhere if we start using broad definitions of what's prohibited uh, in that manner. So I, I would just urge you, if you're thinking about, you know, what types of buffers uh, here, you know, a, a narrow focus uh, is probably a little bit better, certainly from my perspective. But again, I, I think, you know, um, legalization has come. I, I think if we're going to make it legal for consumers, we shouldn't make it difficult for them as well. We should really put it in places where uh, they want to go. And and I would just mention to you, um, interestingly enough, I, I, my conversations with several police chiefs in some of these towns, I can think of a couple in particular, who thought it was a terrible idea to put it in industrial areas. They, they wanted it in commercial areas because it was easier for them to monitor. And they perceived that from a security standpoint, it would be much better uh, to be just sort of in your standard commercial zone. So uh, eyes on the street. Yeah, very much so. So, um, so you know, I, I would urge you to think about that. Um, I, I think some other uh, issues, you know, you're, you're going to be thinking about how many of these places you want as well and sort of, you know, what, what kind of density of this use you want. Um, and we've seen, um, you know, numerous uh, uh, things that were done by cities and towns to try to limit numbers, especially on the retail dispensary side, not so much on the cultivation and manufacturing side, because uh, those were not seen as such impactful uses. But um, so we would th see things, for example, the city of Boston uh, created a, a zoning that said that you couldn't have a dispensary within a half mile of another dispensary. Uh, and so that sort of served the purpose of keeping places spread out, but it also serves the purpose of limiting the actual number uh, that you could have. Um, so, you know, that was uh, that was another, uh, you know, issue that they did uh, to sort of limit numbers. You know, others will just set a hard limit. Um, you know, we will have X number of dispensaries here. Uh, that's fine. But then you sort of get to this issue of, all right, now, how do you decide who who they are? You know, is it first come, first serve, or do we go through a selection process? And if you choose the latter, um, I can tell you it's an invitation for a bit of trouble. Um, I have seen more litigation come out of uh, selection processes in cities and towns where somebody gets spurned, doesn't feel good about it, think there was politics involved, and there's litigation. It's it's we've we've seen quite a bit of that. So. Uh, I, I don't want to tell you which way to go. I would only tell you uh, if you're going to do a selection process, you know, you need to find some way to sort of have some independent arbiter. I think that, that you know, creates some sort of a, a fact-based criteria for making these determinations because I've, I've just seen a lot of complaints about that. So, you know, th th those are the types of issues I, I will just mention uh, before, before we move on. Um, parking is such a big issue here. And you know you'll want to look at at maybe specific types of uh, provisions in your zoning that deal with this. I know, um, you know, when we 
when we initially legalized uh, for adult use in Massachusetts, uh, there was there were two towns that got in line first and were open, and there were traffic jams, hours long traffic jams, because and I kid you not, everybody east of the Mississippi River was going to these two Massachusetts towns out in the western part of the state because they wanted to see what it was all about, and and. We know that because you could just see the license plates from all the different places where they were coming by. Um, and so that's created, uh, as I've gone forward over the last couple of years with towns, they're all terrified uh, that that's going to happen, you know, to their town. And I had to explain there were only two, you know, everybody wanted to see it. Since that time, we've got, you know, well over 100 retail dispensaries. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's it's that has eased. But you still do need. Uh, especially in those sort of early opening days of these places where there's a curiosity factor, you, you want to make sure that you have some some parking standards in place that has adequate parking for these types of uses. So um, that's what I, I would say. I think the parking is a great point because so many people just like miss that in general of <laughs> like addressing parking, unless you are like working in a municipal sector and land use, then you know parking is the issue and a, a huge issue. But people that are traditionally in the cannabis sector, I don't think most people are thinking about parking when they're doing like site, site designs. Um, but it's so important. And especially it's not even because we think about like, you're going to have people, as you said, like from out of town coming in, um, especially, you know, we also have delivery here. So it's like, are you going to have loading areas? So taking things into consideration, I've seen, I mean, in, in, I guess in some of the areas where I think the medical has come about, uh, for ordinances, sometimes it goes for the default for New Jersey, for whatever the underlying parking conditions or something that's like the most similar, whether it's retail or just like manufacturing or industrial space that do like uh, parking regulations that way but even with that you can't prepare for everybody coming in from all these different towns and from out of state into your area where are they going to go I mean obviously you can't prepare for ever to suit everybody right but there's got to be some sort of parking plan for sure yeah but I think you can think ahead too yeah you know, and that's that's the role of your planner to to think about where the where the industry is going you know and you know one is and phil brought this up now that massachusetts has normalized somewhat things calm down and your parking requirements become less important versus initially and we see this in almost every market where you yeah know, where, where we always thought was a very high standard like five per thousand feet <laughs> is is actually right. something that initially the market kind of needs so as I've been dealing with towns, particularly those with, you know, who are big enough to have a downtown and maybe a highway commercial corridor is to think about the commercial corridor first before you let the beast in the interior of the downtown, because you, you're, you might already have some parking issues in the downtown. And then as things normalize, then you can perhaps, <coughs> you know, amend your zoning to allow other things to happen. Yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna, yeah, I was just going to ask one question for you guys to contribute with this because it brings up really good points before we move forward. It's like, uh, can you talk about, well, I guess anybody here, want to talk about the activation of these, er say, areas that you really want to activate of zone is, uh, in your town? Um, how is that, you know, I've, I always see like cannabis can, facilities really can be a, a way to activate these sort of empty um, spaces, especially, you know, business right. districts that are kind of have a lot of empty storefronts because of, re you know, COVID and the economy. So, I mean, both, I would love to hear from like Chuck and Phil about your perspective from like the planning point of view with this. I, um, yeah. and any comments, uh, Jen, you want to say too? I, I can just, you know, weigh in what it's been, uh, I know this happened out in Colorado and, and it's really on the way here in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, the this I, I've been harping on, oh, you, you know, don't let these retails go into industrial areas. On the other hand, uh, for cultivation, that's probably a better place in a lot of ways, especially because of odor issues and noise and things like that. And um, and it's been amazing how it has really revitalized, you know, all of these warehouse buildings, so many of them that have gone out of use and they're just sitting there vacant. Well, they're perfect for this. A lot of them are anyway. And so it's really 
a great opportunity to you know find a use for buildings that are that are otherwise just sitting there uh, you know underutilized so we've seen that a lot um, in Massachusetts it's it's the the uh, what you have to pay to lease and or buy some of these buildings has shot up really in the last couple of oh, years oh, because yeah. there's so much demand right now yeah and that you know you know what we saw out west you know certainly you know felt consistent with what you uh, I mentioned, Phil, uh, and but now that you know the last mile distribution and and uh, online shop COVID has exacerbated an already interesting American phenomenon where we need more places to store stuff coming from overseas that people are asking to have shipped the next day to their doorstep. Right. And so so that so that has put tremendous pressure on on the availability of property throughout the state. I mean, we're looking at properties all over the place. We're competing with, with big industrial developers who are just gobbling up land and, and building big giant warehouses. But um, be that as it may, I mean, Heather brought up a good point about, you know, we've been focusing a lot of our attention, particularly on the retail side, because it does bring so much energy to, to a, an area that, you know, you have a redevelopment area, say, that has been has been hit hard by, um, you know, the, the woes of retail. And if you bring that in there, it acts as sort of a, a uh, an anchor store, what the old anchor stores used to do for us. And we're finding that 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 is actually an appropriate way of, of revitalizing a shopping center or um, a, a property that is just not, you know, turned over, and especially now that we see the, the right aids and the, and the, the, the Eckerts and, and those sort of consolidating and, and leaving empty shells that are sort of perfect for these uses. So thinking, thinking creatively about, you know, the wear on the retail, but also when I started thinking, you know, in 2018, you know, as when we had just vertical licenses available. So, you know, folks were looking for licenses that were, you know, had everything in the same building. And they weren't required to do that, but it was an opportunity to kind of look a little bit more um, from a design perspective. How, how could we potentially allow somebody to cultivate in a retail area? Well, in my eye, mind, it was like I didn't want a cultivator only to just be in a retail area. But if they were cultivating behind the active storefront, and it was it was it was tucked back and behind. Then that was fine. They could kind of do 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 both in the same um, the same address. And you might have properties like that. You know, I know there's a couple of towns where I have, you know, on the front end there's retail, on the back end there's these big office spaces that, you know, they were you know these these weird um, you know buildings that pop up you know popped up during the. Uh, uh, the, the expansion out of Trenton in particular, mm -hmm. we, we saw, saw a lot of these when uh, the industrial revolution started going out to the inner ring suburbs. Um, so there's a lot of buildings out there that, that can be creatively <coughs> reused and, and repurposed. Definitely. Well, now going on to lessons learned from Massachusetts. So Jen, as a former politician, right. And a former regular, regular person, um, can you, <laughs> You must have had a lot of upset residents, right? You must have. Can you talk about how do we balance resident concerns and both incentivize the growth of the cannabis business industry? Because I'm sure you had to speak towards your constituents at the end of the day. Well, in the beginning, when the law was being passed through the legislature, I was a sitting senator and I represented 11 cities and towns in North Central Massachusetts, which in turn means, you know, a lot of land. We had a lot of land. There's farmland up here. There's all kinds of things that the cities didn't have. I answered to those constituencies. But at the end of the day, when as a regulator, my job was to make sure that we were doing this in the best possible way that we as regulators felt it should have mm. been done. Um, from the general public, we were criticized as listening to industry. From industry, we were criticized as not being friendly enough. From, you know, a, a whole host of, of areas, you know, and I told other regulators this in, in this, the country, I said, just get ready for the criticism because you're going to get it from everyone. And it goes back to what I said, that this is a very emotional issue for some people. This, the issue of cannabis, the illegality of it, the federal status of it, 
this has broken up families. It's broken up communities. It, it's had a whole sort of wreaking havoc on people's lives that other industries did not have. So when you start from there, um, you sort of think of it in a different way. The other thing when it came to my situation is that I was the public health appointee. So my job was to ensure that public health was addressed during the conversations of regulatory implementation. Um, and I don't think that people of Massachusetts truly understand that I have, I want to say like 25 regulatory line items that are public health driven that no one would even pay attention to because it doesn't outwardly say public health. And so at the end of the day, the five regulators had to really come to terms with, again, what did we want people's towns to look like? What did we want this to look like in Massachusetts? And while there was a playbook from Colorado and California and Washington and Oregon and Alaska, they weren't Massachusetts, right? So you can easily jump the borders. You know, you can easily go from state to state here in New England. So we didn't want people coming in, starting businesses and leaving. So we made the micro businesses with a residency requirement that you had to be from here. Why? Because the general public wanted to be able to have a small 2,500 plot land. They didn't yeah. want the 100,000 square foot grow. Um, municipalities have control here in Massachusetts. We wanted the municipalities to understand you have a role in this. You know, what do you want your cities and towns to look like going forward? Uh, you know, the businesses that you talked about that started on day one in um, Phil, Leicester is not Western Mass, it's Central Mass. <laughs> you guys not remember this? <laughs> um, this just reminds me of like a debate of whether Central New Jersey exists and having been growing up in Central New Jersey. Or if yeah. Brunswick is in Central or not. <laughs> I stand reprimanded. I don't think you're in Western Mass. Like, no, you still had another hour and a half to go. So, um, we I did address um, one of with one of the entities uh, concerning the parking, and I said to them, "You're gonna have problems tomorrow. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're not. Yeah, you are." They had the problems. The business next to them suffered. It was Christmas time. They sold Christmas trees, and I looked at the owner and said, "You should have done something for them." You should have bought the trees and donated them or something because you pull, you know, the roads were a parking lot. Nobody could get in or out. Um, there are ways to mitigate that. And your municipal officials are best to have that conversation. Um, but I think the other thing, too, that we learned is that you have to talk about the elephant in the room. Right. People feel as though when it comes to how many facilities are in each city and town. Well, if we don't have X number of facilities, we won't have the social problems that come with cannabis. <coughs> yes, you will. People cross borders of communities every day. Just because you don't have the dispensary doesn't mean you're not going to have someone operating under the influence. Just because you don't have the cultivation doesn't mean someone's not going to try to have an illegal grow somewhere else. So the more you regulate it, the more you actually talk about what some of the concerns are, not to try to be, you know, oppositional, not to try to say you don't want legalization, but the more you talk about what it looks like, I think there's more of an education for everyone to understand that this is a new industry. The substance does alter people's state. Um, if it didn't, we wouldn't be working. We wouldn't be dealing with the federal government the way that we have to. Uh, how do we mitigate that here in our state? So how does New Jersey mitigate all of that to say, what do we do what's best for the residents of New Jersey? And I think in Massachusetts, you know, like I said, our only limits were dispensaries. You yeah. could have a, a, however many cultivation sites as you wanted. We have safeguards in place. If you're not selling, I think, like 70 to 80 percent of your product, we'll drop your tier down at, at renewal. The Cannabis Commission will. But we're not saying, no, you can't have these businesses. And at the same time, you have things like positive impact plans, which every license, every applicant has to have. How are you going to positively impact a disproportionately impacted area? Those communities that were the most impacted by the war on drugs. Is it the best plan? No. Could it be better? Absolutely. Um, I'm still hoping the commission passes my new most recent report for the DIA so we can increase the number of cities and towns to like 50. But right now we only have 29 in Massachusetts. So you're going to have those bumps and bruises along the way. But the reality is that at the municipal level, you have a better understanding of what you want this to look like. And I think you really have to look five years out. You can't look over the next year or so, you know, because like Phil said, you know, one of the communities that I used to represent in Fitchburg, it was an old 
paper city, mill city, all of those buildings are now being renovated. That's good for the city. Um, you don't see what's inside. The kids aren't driving by on the school bus to see what's in the window. Um, and that's coming from the public health person. Uh, you know, we don't have them in downtown with these big open windows that everyone knows what's going on inside. There are some safeguards you can put in place. And, and I think it was just, we had to get there on our own. And while we looked at the other states, we were small enough that people could just come and go. I don't think the other states had as much of a problem like that like we did. So I think that's a good point. Uh, you made excellent points here. And I think it's a good way to segue into local licensing. So you mentioned positive impact statements. Now that's another thing that's not required at the local level for New Jersey as on part of the state regulations right now. But um, I mean, as far as like, it probably, it's usually in the application itself, but it's not like someone has to put it into the municipality right now, unless they put in an ordinance. Unless I'm wrong, Chuck, you can correct me on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, but way, the, way, the way it works in Massachusetts, though, is that you're required to have a positive impact plan as part of your application to the state. But that plan is then executed in the, the cities and towns. And so we have 29 designated disproportionately impacted areas. We did a study. We took a look at um, employment rates and unemployment rates and, and you know, yearly, you know, income, things like that. So we came up with this report, which is on the commission's website. Um, and it was just newly redone. Like it was just updated a couple months ago. The plan is to go into the communities, whether you're going to do expungement cases for people that have records, whether you're going to give money to particular um, local community of um, events or committees. I mean, we have some people that give money to sober homes. We have people that have given money to um, substance abuse coalitions. I mean, the, what have you. Uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Girls Inks, the YMCAs, you have to ask them because the charter and most of them say you can't take money from alcohol and tobacco. Well, it's reasonably expected you're not going to be able to take money from the cannabis industry. So we didn't want people just saying they were going to throw money at organizations that couldn't take it. So we require a letter from the accepting organization saying, yeah, we'll take your money. We're fine with this. And it was really to ensure that the positive impact plans were having a positive impact because as a regulator, I can't watch you all year to find out if you're gonna go host that expungement you know, seminar. Uh, there were educational seminars that people could learn how to get into the industry. So there's a whole host of creative ways that these entities could go into the municipalities um, they're not, you know, I was a stickler for, for the positive impact plans no, because of my time in the legislature and knowing what it takes to help communities. You weren't allowed to give to national organizations unless you could tell me how that town, the designated town, was going to be positively affected by that. I didn't want you having memberships in national or state organizations. I wanted you to go into the city and town and do something positive with that. Amen. Um, and I think that the municipalities appreciated that even though there was a hesitancy to take cannabis money, right? Because again, the education piece of it was crucial. Um, you know, it's funny when I got my job on the commission, there's a lot of headlines and I was the first one appointed and, and what have you, and I voted no, so that was a big deal to people. My bank asked me if my paycheck was coming from cannabis companies because they weren't sure they wanted me to bank there anymore. So they didn't even have an understanding of the bureaucracy and, and what was going on. So it's going to take a lot of education for people to become comfortable with this. And you just have to be able to educate them intelligently. Um, so uh, I would be remiss if I did not respond to some of this uh, from a slightly <laughs> different perspective. Uh, I, I, I fully That's appreciate- That's you're here, Phil. I, I understand. <laughs> I, I fully appreciate uh, yeah, the, the work, quite frankly, that the commission did with these positive impact plans, I think it's fantastic. I, I want to point out, though, and I think it's important to point out, especially to municipalities, um, what what I have tended to see representing, you know, probably over 100 businesses in Massachusetts doing these types of, of this type of work is these businesses are bombarded right now with uh, requirements. You need to pay this to this place for your positive impact plan. You need to pay an impact fee to this town. It's it's left and right. Uh, you know, there is sort of this expectation that the cannabis industry is capable of 
uh, operating a business under uh, you know these types of expectations about what they can pay to various uh, communities and organizations, et cetera. Um, the reality is uh, what we saw in Massachusetts with, uh, in a lot of cases was early on, companies would go out, they would get licenses, they would get permitted, and they would never get open, okay? Because the cost of operating these places uh, and developing them can be enormous, especially, for example, if you're talking about a cultivation facility. If you're talking about a cultivation facility in the Northeast, where you are you know, gonna have anything 20,000 square feet or more of cultivation space, you're up well upwards of 5 million and, and getting closer to $10 million to get that into development. And that's gotta be repaid. It's often gotta be repaid at significant interest rates because uh, you know, it's a risky business and that's what okay. lenders do. And so with all of that, you're being asked to pay the town this, pay this organization that it becomes daunting for a lot of these companies. So I would just say, you know, I, I, I think uh, we're gonna get into this, I think later, if we talk a little bit about, you know, impact fees that might be paid to a town under a host community agreement. Um, I would urge, you know, just trying to sort of lay low a little bit uh, and, and, and maybe try to work with your companies to understand what the constraints are financially for them when you're developing these types of, of plans. I'm glad you mentioned the impact fees because one of the things that I've also have heard from municipalities in New Jersey is that they're afraid of the costs of, they think that if they have these facilities in, the amount of money, they need a, like a huge amount of impact fee just to cover police yep. services. And then I talked to Massachusetts people and they're like, it hasn't changed anything. <laughs> let, let, let me... If, if I can give you some some anecdotal uh, evidence there, there there's uh, you know Massachusetts has a state law that says that you can charge impact fees as a municipality, but it can't exceed three uh, percent. And not only that, but the fees that you charge are supposed to be reasonably related to the impacts, and you and the communities are supposed to keep documentation of what those actual impacts are, and they're supposed to provide it to the commission as well to show what they are, and so. When we started negotiating host community agreements, every single community said, all right, well, we want the maximum 3% impact fee. And uh, because it was a requirement of licensure, you know, most of my clients didn't have a choice but to agree to it. And so they all have host community agreements that, uh, you know, require 3% and they're good for five years under state law. And everybody, you know, isn't thrilled about it. But uh, I say to them, well, in four years, here's what's gonna happen, okay? you're gonna to get to renegotiate these agreements and the town is gonna to have to show its documentation as to all of the costs that it's incurred. And if you go around to these towns right now, you will find out there just aren't the, those types of costs. I don't doubt that some towns have chosen to go and have police trained for you know such things as driving under the influence and things like that. I, I'm sure there are some expenses and I'm sure there's some expense associated with monitoring these companies or helping set them up. But by and large, all of the all of the warnings about how difficult this was going to be, how much the police were going to be involved, how much extra cost, none of them have come true. That's right. just the reality. Right. So, you know, the, the, when, when it comes to renegotiate these fees, I think the towns are going to be very hard pressed to show that they need 3% of your revenues uh, for that purpose. So now relating back to New Jersey, Chuck, what have you seen or what have you recommend, I guess, for your clients at the local <coughs> level for these local licensing? Since, like, we don't have any sort of instructions, really, for local licensing in New Jersey. And it's kind of just, like, it could be dangerous, yeah. I would say. So what is your recommendations? Or what have well, you... Well, one is, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure to warn all my municipalities that you cannot just view this as a cash cow and that you can just like, you know, put your card in the ATM machine and expect, you know, good things to happen. Um, you know, creation of a new industry, I think, you know, as somebody with, with, with an, what I, I think is an ethic about the, uh, the industry in itself and, and my honoring of the medicine in particular is as much about community development and, uh, as it is economic. So when I'm looking at this local licensing process and, 
and the ability for a town to to kind of uh, formalize a process by which they're going to you know give support. I I want to ensure that one it's is it, it's not <coughs> subjective, right? And and it's highly you know it's it's highly um, uh, transparent and predictive. So we've looked at the the, the legislation itself. Uh, you know, which asks for community, local community plans, work, local workforce development plans, social justice stuff. I, you know, I think we're going to see more from the CRC in that regard. Um, but, you know, for me is I want to kind of, I don't want to ask them for more than they already, they're already being asked for a lot. And I'm not trying to exude a pound of flesh out of them. You know, uh, I'm trying to ensure that we're actually creating like a real partnership and a collaboration here because there is opportunity to, you know, grow an industry, you know, while at the same time, you know, really making a, a, a real impact locally. And, you know, we want to make sure that that happens to the extent we can. Yeah, it's interesting because I think that a lot of times we hear people talk about purely just like the 2% tax that would come from any sort of sales in New Jersey for municipalities as really like the incentive for towns to adopt it. However, that excludes jobs, <laughs> you know, and as well as benefits for adjacent sort of um, a businesses we discussed. So I just want to see, uh, you know, I've read the <laughs> ordinances in Boston um, that were from Massachusetts, you know, Boston and then other places in Massachusetts where they had like training programs put into their ordinances where they would allow that um, because that's especially when we talk about these social equity sort of applicants and micro businesses. I mean, it's such a new industry how do you get trained on it? How do you get your yeah. local, the local businesses to get trained on it if they want to be in, your local residents want to come in? And so can you just, um, Jen or Phil, can you just speak to those sort of training programs that were implemented by the municipalities? Um, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that's been a major focus uh, of most of the municipalities. Um, it's almost more, I think, uh, at, at the state level. I know there's, you know, responsible vendor training programs, and uh, but it, it just hasn't really been uh, that much of a focus. I don't know if you feel differently, Jen, but that's sort of. I, what th I think seen. from the local level, you know, the stand the standpoint we sort of took was because again, there was no local licensing. It was just part of the process, and your license comes from the Cannabis Commission in Massachusetts. So when it comes down to the locality. You know, we used to push using local ancillary businesses to help build out your facility. You know, use that local plumber, electrician, lumber yard, um, painters, and what have you. Utilize the trades in your communities that you normally would for anything else, because there are limits to what really can happen for training programs. You know, your local community college cannot really host a full-blown training program <coughs> where students are receiving Pell Grants because the Pell Grants come from the federal government. Your community colleges can do horticulture training, but it's not necessarily the cannabis plant because it can't be on the college campus. So at every step of the way, you have to, as a municipal official or state official, recognize that that federal obstacle is right there. And how do you do a workaround to try to benefit the people in the municipality? Um, you know, part of the positive impact plans would be education seminars on how to write a business plan, how to write a resume, how to do. And that's something that your probably your career centers already do under your workforce training boards for everybody else in the state. Utilize those types of services to be able to get into the cannabis industry. For Massachusetts, we had a required diversity plan, which quite frankly, I think is more difficult than anything else because given the fact that only 29 of our 351 cities and towns are considered disproportionately impacted areas, how many people are you truly <coughs> getting out of these areas to come to these jobs if they're so spread out? Um, I can tell you in the dead of winter, no one's driving 30 miles in Massachusetts for a, a lower level job in a cannabis you know, company if they have to drive through the snow and risk getting in an accident. It's just, it's not realistic. Right. And so it's up to the municipalities to try to find ways to benefit their community 
by being very realistic. I mean, um, we talk about social equity. We talk about trying to help people in the municipalities. Those are all great segues into trying to create programming. But the reality of the everyday implementation isn't always there. And so as a municipal official, you know, I would hope that they start to say, OK, well, if you're going to use ancillary businesses, we'll give you a point for that. Or we'll look at you more favorably than someone who brings in like a national lumber company to deliver whatever. Yeah. Use what you have in your communities. I mean, it, it, it worked for other bus businesses. Why not this one? Yeah. And and. And most communities, uh, when they do a host community agreement in Massachusetts, there's a provision in it that says, you know, you that that you pledge as a business that you will try to hire locally for your employees. You'll hire local vendors. Sometimes there are even, you know, percentages set forth about how many local employees you have to hire. So <laughs> you, you do have the ability to sort of, you know, press the companies to to benefit uh, the local community. But, but I think the and I, you're right, and I think the municipality has the not only the authority, but they have the ability to be creative in what works for them. The one thing that I can't stand is when people try to say, "Well, this works for so and so, this is going to work for you too." No, no, it's not. No, you know, I come from 50 miles west of Boston. People that live here can't jump on the T. They can't jump on a trolley or a subway to go wherever they're going to go. They have to drive. We don't have a robust transportation system. So when you talk about jobs and you talk about, you know, where they're going to go, that's an obstacle for some people. So we need to take that into account. Yeah. Municipal officials have the ability and they, they do have the wherewithal that they know their community best. Um, how do you balance legalizing this and providing for your residents with at the same time allowing it a business industry to grow? over time in your community. You have to balance the two. If you don't, it's gonna fail. I mean, you're, you're just not gonna have anything that's gonna be productive and you're gonna have a building stuck in your town that's empty again. Yeah, and I, yeah. I mean, and I think that's, you know, we've been focused on that, you know, almost exclusively, not looking at exacting, you know, $25,000, $30,000 application fees, which is absolutely ludicrous, by the way, no offense to anybody who may be charging dinner that's on the on the line, but you know, you know, developing a real partnership that actually has some meaningful change on the ground is is the most important thing, and I think that keeps you out of trouble too. So not only does the community benefit, but but you stay out of harm's way with with regard to you know just staying true to you know, the community and the application process and, and the like. Yeah, you know, as, a, as a former senator and a former regulator, I, I prided myself on the fact that I would never give people false hope. I was never going to give you false hope that you were going to get the keys to the kingdom if you didn't have the resources to do that. And I think, you know, what we would say to smaller companies is I don't want you closed in three years. I, I want you to be able to succeed here. I don't want to do a, a ribbon cutting and a grand opening for two and a half years from now. You shut down. And so I think that's sort of the backbone of where some of the policy came from. I, I think from all the commissioners at the Ethics Cannabis Commission and how we would say to the local officials, you don't want them closed in three years. You want this to succeed. And for a whole different webinar, you wanted to succeed also for public safety and public health reasons because the illegitimate market can start to have be impacted by that. You want safe, tested, regulated products that people are using because you don't want them sick. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I'm going to going to open it up now for questions. If anybody has questions um, from our attendees, sure. How? And I'm more than happy to answer questions after. If people yeah, if anybody wants to put anything on the chat or um, you know, can you turn on the speaker. If not, we'll just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do some like final thoughts before any it. Okay, so it looks like we don't have anything right now. Uh, but just in general, uh, I'm going to make one comment just for what Jen said about the health, um, health education and different sort of factors in the illicit market. Um, I'm from the Dare generation. Uh, for the Dare group, when they taught you, you know, don't do drugs. <laughs> 
And that did not work for people. Uh, lots of opioid overdoses in Marlboro, New Jersey. <laughs> um, that's where I'm from. So it's really unfortunate. Um, and, you know, when I go to different events or speak to people about cannabis industry coming to New Jersey, a lot of times the concern is, but the children, you know, what the children, usually I respond back of being like, guess what? Like a drug dealer does not take IDs. <laughs> uh, but I want to know, especially from Jen, what you guys did with both public education of the drug awareness for those people who were like, but the children. <laughs> right. So, you know, it's important to understand that my work in the legislature was in addiction and substance abuse services and mental health and disabilities. And I come from that whole public health background. Um, you know, my mom's a, a, a former ER nurse and worked in the helicopter taking care of people that, you know, needed more services. So my whole thing when I got to the commission was we need to educate, 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 because otherwise we're going to go down the same road that we went down that we have now with the heroin and oxy issue. And that purely was because there was a lack of education. And so unfortunately for the governor, when he did appoint me to this position, um, I turned around and asked for money from the legislature to do a public awareness campaign because the one thing that I had learned from one of the other states that had legalized was that they waited too long. The stores were opening before the campaign was out. And so we started really early in Massachusetts with um, two campaigns. One was Know the Law, uh, just the basics of what the law was that passed, because people really didn't understand what they were voting for, for the most part. You know, I had a lot of people say to me, I just thought the kid next door wouldn't get in trouble. I didn't know there was going to be a whole industry coming to my backyard. And then the other one was how to have adults talk to children. And it was more of not even parents, but adults, <coughs> whether it was your coach, your guidance counselor, your school nurse, your parent, your guardian, your foster mom, you know, stepmom, whatever. And so those two campaigns have been pretty um, successful. And we saw the data of how many clicks they got on the internet and what sections they were going to. But we also had consumer education at the dispensary. They were putting pamphlets into with the products. And then there was a um, there was a partnership between AAA, the Executive Office of Public Safety, and the Cannabis Commission, and I think the Department of Public Health, where we had these little flyers made up to say, you know, don't do drugs and drive, like don't use substances and drive. The one misunderstanding and misconception that people have right now is that we have an OUI in Massachusetts. Everything comes under it, whether it's, you know, allergy medicine or nighttime sleeping medicine or cannabis or oxy or heroin or what, alcohol or t whatever you have. Um, we already have that encompassed. And so it was educating people on where we are in Massachusetts about that. And I, I really was adamant about pushing the education piece because, again, I'm not giving people false hope. We're not going to pretend something doesn't exist and then you get in trouble for it. Um, and so we were very fortunate for that. Our campaign is called More About Marijuana. And so the website is moreaboutmj.org. And it, it has a multitude of, of pages Great. and sections, whether you're looking to use this for the first time, whether you're a parent, whether you're trying to find you know out more about it. it and it's just basic information. Great. I, so we have a bunch of questions. So, um, and I think that's a great thing. So first one I just wanna start with. So New Jersey has micro businesses that we're gonna be doing. Right. And Massachusetts has micro businesses. Can you tell me about your experience with micro businesses in Massachusetts? How's that working out for you guys? I mean, people apply for them. It's not more about how are they working out? It's, it's do people want to apply for them? And, and they have. There have been some people, especially um, farmers who have said, I just want to put a small plot back on this land. Again, looking at the federal status, you can't put it on land that has a federal loan for farming. So, you know, it's it's small. It's a small contingency, a small part of our licensing, but but it's there. Phil, have you done with dealt with any sort of micro businesses? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trying to understand in you know he, if we're talking about the same thing because here, really, a micro business is little more than uh, it's a small cannabis business. Okay, a small local cannabis business often. Farmers, it, it's somewhat popular with, uh, but it sort of allows uh, operation. Some of the fees are lessened. Some of the red tape uh, goes away, but that's it's really on a smaller level. So we've seen some of it, uh, not a ton, though. So New Jersey has their micro businesses are unlimited where you can get um, a license. It's restricted to twenty five hundred square feet. Um, and 
you can get for dispensary, cultivation, processing. But one of the rules is that you have to be one. Uh, the owner has to have like be a resident of that municipality. Yeah, like, 100 yeah. percent. So do you have anything that's more like that, where it's like a sort of residency requirement? Maybe it's not called micro businesses. Maybe it's called something else. Well, I mean, we have the, we have the residency requirements for that. I mean, I don't know what else you would call it. Uh, yeah, you know? I, th I think your micro licenses are similar to to ours um, and how they were set up, at least. Um, so. I mean, but you're but you're saying that not too many folks have actually taken advantage of. of it wasn't a majority of our licenses. I mean, I think no. some people have, but again, I think also some people have waited to see what this industry is going to look like because we don't limit cultivation, we don't limit manufacturing. Um, the only thing we're limiting is a dispensary. So if you're a micro business, you're not a dispensary. Um, that some people have just waited. You know, it's, it's interesting enough in Massachusetts, too, and Phil can tell me if I'm wrong, but people have been waiting for delivery licenses. They didn't want to do anything else with the license types that we already had. They've been waiting for delivery since the day, you know, we were we were established. And there are others that are waiting for on-site consumption licenses. So you're not going to see them applying until those license types are available. It's just what people are, are hoping to open. It's what their business plan is. Um, we really don't ask why. Yeah, so it's a good point they put about on-site consumption. So can you explain what's going on right now with the on-site consumption lounges? I know that right now it's not permitted in Massachusetts, but there's someone that's trying to do a workaround and there's legislation. Can you just go explain a little bit about that right so now? The, the Cannabis Commission is waiting for the authority to allow on-site consumption. There is a provision of the law that says towns have to opt in. And through that opt-in process, it's through a ballot process during one of our election cycles. The Secretary of State has, has determined that there is sort of a snag in the process and that it can't be successfully executed. And there needs to be a statute change in the legislature to allow for that to happen. Um, we don't know. We don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know how that's going to happen. I know the legislature right now is do, conducting their public meetings. This is the time of year where the public meetings, because they're in the first of a two year legislative cycle, um, it's going through the process and it's going to depend on whether or not the legislature decides to take up um, cannabis issues. Does it have so the a commission lot of has to wait for the for the, uh, the authority to come through. Does it have support, though? Is it it's something that Massachusetts wants right now? Or Cannabis isn't a major priority <laughs> issue in the legislature right now. And I think, yeah. honestly, you know, for the for the 22 years I spent there, um, given COVID, it's still not going to be the priority because we're still allowing curbside. So um, hopefully enough time has now passed since the actual law was passed you know usually you give it a year or two when a major piece of legislation is passed like that maybe they'll start to do mini packages that they'll pass with some of the issues that <coughs> commissioners have mentioned to legislators in the general public um, but there's no way of knowing yet so, safe to say i think that that is going to be a whole new battlefront um yeah. you know it, it implicates obviously the driving issue uh, and and so you know I I I have to say things have gotten uh, it's gotten a lot easier to get companies get towns and cities on board uh, allow these businesses to open a lot of a lot of cities and towns have welcomed it with open arms and just realized the the potential economic benefits but I think I, I really think that uh, consumption lounges are are not going to be very easy I, I can just see. Um, a lot of the same people that were originally opposed to legalization in the first place and have sort of gone with the flow and maybe accepted that it's here and it hasn't been uh, such a such a bad experience. I, I see them popping right back up again with consumption lounges. I think it's going to be a real battle. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I know that you guys don't consider host agreements to be a local licensing type of thing. I consider it to be more like kind to like local licensing where it's yeah. like you're still having an agreement there so you don't have in massachusetts you don't have like it doesn't say a municipality is allowed to do local licensing but you are required to do this host agreement which has the same type of mechanisms as a weird enough as 
some sort of local licensing where you have to pay a fee, correct? You but have to I, enter I, into a contract. But I think it's, it's very limited. I mean, yeah, the commission is well, taking your license away, not the community. That, so that, if something yeah. happens, the life, the you know, your community host agreement is good, like Phil said, for five years. The community can't take your license away. It's the Cannabis Control Commission that will take, that will not renew your license and, and has the authority to have enforcement issues and, and assess fines and, and what have you. The municipality is allowed to have the, the agreements and they're going to tell you where you can go, but there's no official license from them. No, it's, it's, and just so you understand, there's actually, in some communities, there's actually, uh, th there's three separate processes that you actually have to go through in some municipalities. Some you have to get this host agreement, then you have to get a special permit under zoning, and some of them have a local licensing uh, procedure. But l leaving aside that last little bit, it, the, the, I think the way it's similar is, it, you, you don't get anywhere in the state process to get a state license until you have a host agreement. Okay, that's a prerequisite. So it really is sort of like the gatekeeper here, where the town decides who do we give them to and how many do we give? And what are the terms, obviously, you have to negotiate that. But so, I mean, Jen's clearly right. It's not the, the state license is sort of a different thing. And the Cannabis Control Commission deals with that. But if you want to get going in the first place, you do have to get this host agreement. And so there is a process which is very much akin to a, a licensing process where, where the town sort of meets you, you make a presentation, you try to convince them that you understand the regulations that, you know, and then you, you do an agreement that, you know, where you agree to be bound by all of the state and the local, uh, you know, requirements. Uh, so, so there is that similarity. Yeah, it, but I, and, I, and I think the only thing too, though, is that Heather in Massachusetts, it's important for us to say that it's not local licensing because our alcohol licenses are at the local level. Right. They're not state, they're not at the state level. So you have an X amount of number of alcohol licenses that you can have in a community that do come from the board in the community. It doesn't come essential. The state is the second factor versus the community who's the multi, you know, the primary cannabis the city's the you know second factor and the primary fact is the state i mean i think that's why we have to appear to you know distinguish between the two because people with alcohol licenses are like well wait the local board comes in and takes away my license so it, whether it be a host, or, host agreement or any other sort of mechanism of between the private entity as well as the municipality itself fees we're talking about fees here. What do you see? What have you seen as a reasonable licensing, reasoning fee? I'm not going to say licensing, reasonable fees for these companies. I know that Massachusetts, with their host agreements, it seems like you got they revised things. And I would love Jen to kind of comment on this. Where then it got to this whole three percent has to be no more than three percent. But before that, it looked like it was all over the map, right? <laughs> well, I do think, and, and again, Phil can tell me if I'm wrong, but I do think that a turning point is going to be the fact that the mayor of Northampton said he's going to essentially do away with the 3% impact fees, which I think you're going to force other communities to finally get rid of the 3% impact fees. The reality is that, yes, it was supposed to mitigate the, the impact to having a business here. From a legislative perspective, I thought of things like, okay, if you have X more number of cars on a road, that, that road's going to have to be paved sooner than had been planned in our chapter, you know, 90 transportation funding schedule. That's a made, that's an impact fee. Um, if you have an X number of more calls from your EMS and ambulance, and that's a wear and tear on the, on the trucks because people are, are not educated and they're over consuming and they don't know what to do. So they're calling 911. That could reasonably be an impact. Um, you know, police in the beginning, they were doing details, you know, and they should have done details because the parking issue was ridiculous in the beginning. That could have been a reasonable impact. Is that 3%? Is that really that much money that you're going to have to pay? Chances are they're not. And, you know, and, and I supported having something because I've seen communities with road detours that have gone on for a year and a two or two, and that wasn't what the road was intended for. Yeah, we had to take care of it and pave it and do whatever. Um, 
I think you're going to see a change of heart when people start having a look at what the cities and towns had to actually document as to what they had to pay out. Um, it, you know, and I've asked around. I mean, I've asked local fire departments who run their own ambulance services, and they're like, no, we're not going out on a ton of calls. We're not doing X, Y, or Z. Um, the roads have yet to be determined. I mean, we've had a couple of years, but you're not going to see wear and tear for a while. <coughs> Uh, yeah. And so I, I think that the fees are really going to should be reevaluated and, and reassessed. I, I I wholeheartedly agree. It, it's been this has really been one of the most difficult things to deal with and to, to go and negotiate, you know, with a town, with clients. So you have, as we mentioned, you had a you have a three percent limit here in Massachusetts. But I saw some towns that would get you to sign an agreement that says you pay 3% for that. And then they say, oh, we also want you to pay, you know, a 2% development fee. And I'm like, well, what is, what is a development fee? What does that mean? And and aren't you just, you know, uh, isn't that a violation of the 3%? Oh, no, 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 that's an impact fee. The development fee is different. It's like, ex explain to me what it is. Tell me what 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 the fee is paying for. Somehow I'm, I'm thinking it probably fits into the definition of impact fee. So there's been all sorts of games that have been played uh, to try to get around that. And again, I, I can't reiterate more. I, I dare anybody to just tell me the, the problems that this industry has caused. I, I, I think legalization has been an unmitigated success here in Massachusetts. Okay. Traffic. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and I'm not, I'm not disputing that you, for example, a, a police detail, although I will tell you that most towns, they don't even, they don't, they will charge you. They'll charge the business for the for the police detail oh, and still charge you three percent. They won't take it out of the three percent. Uh, so it, it's you know it's I get it and I get every you know a lot of these municipalities face, face budget shortfalls and it's difficult. But you're doing it on the backs of of businesses um, that you know that there just aren't those kind of margins um, in in most of these cases. So I think you you have to be careful. So if you if I said to you you know, maybe 1% is, you know, the right, I, I, I'm not sure I can, I can tell you, I, 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 and I, and I can't also tell you that every single impact is easily quantifiable. Okay. I suspect that, you know, uh, there are some kind of, like, as Jen said, you know, there's, there's some additional traffic, there is additional wear and tear on the roads, there's additional wear and tear on administrative services associated with monitoring these business. I get all that. I just know it's not even anything close to 3%. And so I, I think it makes some sense. And I think companies are willing to pay something, but I think there's got to be some reasonable balancing here uh, so that we're not just uh, uh, balancing each municipality's books on the backs of, of these businesses. So but at the same time, Phil's right. Massachusetts did it at a time where there was a lack of education. New Jersey has the opportunity to take a look at what Massachusetts did and say, is that right for our communities? Is that what we really want to do to our businesses? Is there some other way to sort of, you know, assess down the road? Because quite frankly, the wear and tear on a road is going to take, you know, years. You're not paying up front for your chapter, well, chapter 90 in Massachusetts. You're not paying up front for your chapter 90 money. You're going to know when that, you know, when that road is supposed to be in the system for a repavement, maybe it had to be done early. So, can there be an assessment to the business later, given the fact that it could be them? But uh, municipalities have the opportunity to learn from Massachusetts, the good and the bad. Um, and it's interesting because when we first got appointed to the commission, uh, you know, five people, five cubicles, the first month of our job, we were calling the other states. And I literally would say, what'd you do wrong? I don't have time to talk to you about what you did right. Just what did you do wrong so we don't do it? And people are very honest about it because you don't have many that have gone before you. There's only, what, 19 states in the country that now have legal, legalized adult use cannabis. Forget the medical side, but the adult use side, there's not that much to go on. You're still writing your playbook. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I just want to get to, um, we have another question soon from James um, Krauss. But before that, uh, Chuck, from your standpoint, you are uh, part of the Ewing Redevelopment Authority, right? Executive Director. So having dealt with redevelopment agreements, you know, that's not considered super licensed, but what do you see, apply what you know from other states. Now, what would you recommend for local licensing just in New Jersey? Again, I know that we talked about this before, just using your experience in the as 
part of the redevelopment, redevelopment authority and as a planner for municipalities. How do you recommend for fees? What are you thinking about fees for this? I know it just, when they're talking about impact fees uh, and all this things. I'm not charging impact fees. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not doing it. I don't think it makes sense. I think our two percent that we're we're allowed by statute is enough, and you know any fees that you know that end up coming out of the negotiation process with how an entity might you know put together a community development plan, and if part of their plan is to donate to a charitable organization that does something, then then so be it. Um, we're not looking to uh, charge impact fees on cops and roads and all this other stuff. We, we know that the impacts really aren't there to, to uh, uh, get into what I think will eventually be a mess because we can't, we can't charge these for any other uses. Um, so, so why, why am I going to start, you know, muddy in the field with, with this special use? Obviously we have a lot more leeway to, 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 uh, to play with because of the federal illegalities, but I, I'm staying out of that fray because it's going to be it's it's going to be federal soon enough, and and all these other things that towns are trying to exact out of out of folks are going to go away. So great, thanks for that response. So we're going to take a question now from James. We'll let our admin put him in. James, are you on yet or? Um, just feel free to talk anytime. You have a question. All right, well, if anybody else has any other questions, please just, uh, you can put it on the chat right now. Otherwise, um, we'll just do some final thoughts on that. And so I'll just give a second right now. Great. Um, great. Well, so like, let's do some final thoughts here from everybody. Uh, we'll start. We'll start with Massachusetts first, and then we'll end with uh, Jersey. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I'll go then. Uh, sort of reiterating, uh, but I I, I want to make clear, you know, to municipalities. I think I think most of my clients, you know, they want to work with the community. Okay, oh, this oh. is. Hold on a second, sorry. Uh, we have oh, James on, we finally got connected. There we go, right. James, question. Tell us uh, where you're, what you're representing before you tell us the questions just so we just know a little bit of context. Where are you, where are you um, speaking from? Um, uh, Atlantic Islands, and um, I'm, I was appointed by our mayor to be on the uh, cannabis uh, task force to evaluate what the uh, municipality should do uh, by August 21st. Mm -hmm. And actually, and actually, with uh, New Jersey state law, we're, 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 we really have to make a decision by July 22nd to uh, get an amendment uh, or an or a, uh, an ordinance through the, uh, the the procedure in the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, my my question really is on the effect of the the banking regulations and and uh, whether. Whether uh, retailers and delivery services can accept credit cards, and if not, has that created any kind of, of uh, crime problem with uh, with the amount of cash that's generated, uh, and perhaps particularly at the delivery uh, on the delivery side in in Massachusetts or in any other state that you're aware of? Sure. Uh, so. We've been fortunate in, in Massachusetts, and I think this is sort of spreading all over in that, uh, you know, when, when this industry began in Colorado, there were not any banks that would deal with this industry. And so it was strictly a cash business. Um, now, uh, because we found several banks in Massachusetts uh, that are willing to, to deal with the business, and, and quite frankly, there's seems like there's more, a couple more come online every couple of months. Uh, most of the businesses that you go to have the capacity to allow customers to use a debit card. So, you know, there are still cash transactions, um, but I, I don't know of dispensaries that aren't using a debit card 
system for most of their transactions. So, um, I, I, you know, they all do, uh, you know, have the capacity, obviously, to handle cash, and most of them use uh, armored car services, you know, to pick that up, bring it to the bank. Uh, but I, I think the vast majority of transactions are via debit card these days. So it's really good news, uh, you know, for safety and security issues. And okay. delivery in Massachusetts just started. So you're, we're not going to have any metrics on that for a little while. I mean, I think the first delivery was what, a couple, a week ago, or a couple weeks ago or something. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's way too new to determine that. <coughs> okay, thank you. Problem. Um, any other questions? Okay. If not, um, let's just go back to final thoughts here. All right. I'll. I'll uh, just uh, sort of following up what, what we've been talking about. Um, I, I really do think that most of my clients, you know, want to work with the communities uh, that they're in. They, uh, no, they're not really trying to sort of force their way in. They're not. Uh, they, they want a cooperative relationship and, and they're willing to accept, uh, you know, that there are some financial obligations uh, for going forward. I, I will tell you, you know, as much as I'm sitting here and sort of constantly reiterating, well, there's no impacts, there's no impacts. I think what I, it's more accurate is the impacts are minimal, but there are impacts and especially on uh, the municipal administrative officials who have to deal with this. You know, we've, we've, uh, we, we execute these host agreements. Invariably, there's a change in the law or the regulations and something needs to be changed in these host agreements. And I find myself, you know, constantly calling people at the town saying, okay, uh, we need to revise this. And, you know, now we've revised it. And, oh, you need to do this certification form. There are a lot of officials in a lot of these towns that are spending a significant amount of their time dealing with the administrative aspects of these businesses, uh, you know, because a lot of these are requirements at the state level that you sort of get municipal approval. So I, I think I think my clients are willing to, you know, compensate municipalities for that. But it's going to take some, you know, to, to do it right, not to sort of overburden the companies. I just think it, it takes some thoughtful uh, work. Uh, to, to sit down with the community and say, here's what we think, you know, is really something you could help us, uh, you know, offset for the type of impact you're going to have and, and come to a, a reasonable agreement on these issues. It's 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 for everybody's benefit, you know, to, to allow the business to operate successfully, which is not just a benefit to the business itself. It really does benefit the community and can in a lot of ways. Shen, you're up. So I, I, I think that, you know, my thought would be that municipal officials not only have the capacity, but the opportunity to really um, participate in the creation of what this industry looks like in New Jersey. And that with a lot of education, I mean, you know, call local officials in states that have already done this. Um, people are willing to talk. They're happy to tell you what their experiences have been. You know, as a as a as a former government official uh, on multiple levels, the one thing I relied upon was other government officials because we just ha we wanted to get it as right as we possibly could. Um, sure, we had our obstacles in Massachusetts. We didn't have staff. We had a short time frame. We had to turn things around. Uh, but I think that having this industry in your communities um, can be a financial benefit but that it's also not disingenuous if you start talking about public health and public safety and airing your concerns. Um, the criticisms are going to come whether you vocalize your concerns or not. So be prepared for that from both sides of the aisle. Um, you know, there are, like as Phil said, there are people that are prohibitionists that just want to continue to see this, this prohibition go backwards. Um, and there are those that just want very minimal regulations. You've got to strike that balance. Um, but you're there. It's able to be done, and, and it's been done in other states. Great, thank you. And then final thoughts, Chuck. Hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's you a know, ride. <laughs> yeah, it, it is, and and you know we're we're we have a ways to go, and uh, you know there's a there's a bill that's potentially on the floor that's going to give us a little bit of breathing room on 
on uh, on this on this August twenty first timeline. I don't know if that's real or not, but you know, I I think that shouldn't stop you from from continuing to uh, ponder these questions and, and being thoughtful and and balanced in, in how you approach this. Um, you know, it's it's an opportunity to really kind of. Uh, be at the ground floor of what I think is is going to be a really robust industry in the state of New Jersey, and you know, being in it uh, thoughtfully, I think is is definitely the, the way to go. Versus sitting on sitting out and and waiting for uh, for for things to to, to uh, become more clear. I think it's clear enough. I mean, Massachusetts is showing us an example. Colorado is showing us, uh, you know, Washington, Oregon, you know. There's there's a lot of lessons learned for and again and against and I think we've we've uh, we've kicked the tires on a number of these different issues uh, before us and and I think we can do it right as long as we 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 do it thoughtfully. Great, thank you so much, guys, for joining us on our panel and thank you everyone who's watching and this is going to be recorded. So if you ever want to send the link to anybody that missed this live, please feel free. And if you have any questions on how to go about this in your town, feel free to contact us. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.